2 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may, may be of God and not of us. Thank you again, everybody, for your cooperation. Okay, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we bow before your throne, remembering who you are and who we are. And Lord, our souls have been thrilled through your gift of music, the wonderful reminder of the future that you have for us because of the gift of Jesus in the beautiful holy city. But Lord, you are still in your great mercy and power preparing us for that day. So we need your spirit. We need your presence. We need you now here in our worship. So take these words and, and thoughts, Father, and may they touch all of our hearts and our lives that we may walk closer with you and appreciate the love that you have for us. We pray in thy name. Amen. How many here know um, what a rock hound is? And I'm not talking about a statue of a dog made out of rocks. <laughs> a rock hound, yes, rock hound. I had an uncle who was a rock hound. And I remember as a young boy, he, uh, a rock hound, by the way, if you don't know, is somebody who goes around and looks for rocks and minerals and, and collects them and makes things out of them. And um, yeah, it's just amazing what God has created out there, even in that. But he told me years back, when I was a little boy even, I remember him talking about this particular uh, legend that the Native Americans had, especially in the, the uh, Warm Springs area, about these wonderful round stones about the size of a softball, plus or minus, that had kind of rough bumps all over them. And the Indians, or the natives, said that they were actually thrown out of Mount Jefferson and Mount Hood by the thunder spirits. They were actually, they thought, thunderbird eggs. And to this day, we know them as thunder eggs. Yes. Did you know that thunder eggs are actually the Oregon State Rock? Yeah. How many of us have seen thunder eggs cut open inside? Yeah, a number of you have. They're marvelous, aren't they? You cut them open inside, and the difference between a geode and a thunder egg, a geode is another round rock that you cut open, and it's hollow inside, usually with crystals in it. But a thunder egg is filled up completely and solidified. So a little difference between a geode and that, but thunder eggs usually have either chalcedony or agates or jasper on the inside and these beautiful, beautiful designs that are cut open and polished. If you'd like to take your Bibles, let's turn to Malachi. Malachi 3. Malachi 3, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 3.17. Malachi 3.17. The Lord speaking, it says, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my what? My jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. His jewels. That's those that fear the Lord, Right? How do you like being called a rock? <laughs> a rock, yes. Do you like that imagery? Is the comparison appropriate? How would you like to be called a ruby? I've known a lady or two that were named rubies. <laughs> but to actually be called a ruby, you know what the largest ruby is or slash was that they found so far in history? 
four pounds, one ruby, 8,500 carats. It's called the Liberty, Car the Liberty Ruby. You can look it up online even. And it's, it's carved or into the shape of the Liberty Bell hanging from the wooden truss. And on the truss and around that is 50 diamonds embedded in it. It was amazing. It was valued at well over $2 million. And, you know, I wanted to run right out and buy it. But my wife said, there's two problems. One is, I don't have that much money. The second problem is, that beautiful ruby was stolen on November 1 of 2011, and nobody has a clue where it is to this day. So, instead of being able to go out and buy a ruby, I got a picture of one. That's all I can afford. <laughs> so, I'm looking to see, it's beautiful. I don't know, hopefully it's big enough you can see it. Yeah, they're beautiful, beautiful. I ask, where does the red color come from? Does it come from inside this jewel? Do you fear a trick question? <laughs> Pretty quiet. The color doesn't exactly come from there because the color red is not generated by the ruby. Surprise, surprise. The coloration actually comes from light passing through it. When you take a white light and you put it through a prism, you find, well, I grew up, it was seven colors. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. What I understand now, some years back, for some reason, they decided indigo doesn't count, so they call six colors now. I still see indigo. But the material inside a ruby actually absorbs all the color except red. The molecular makeup of the ruby causes it to transmit or allow through only the specific wavelength of light where it hits the back of our eyes and the retina, we perceive that as a color we call red. If you take another jewel, say a sapphire or an amethyst, it would reveal another part of the glory that is found in light. And friends, a jewel can no more boast of its appearance than a mirror. They both simply reflect or transmit the glory of something else. Let's look at today's text again in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. It says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be from us? No, may be of God and not of us. So not much difference between us and the jewel then, right? Okay, let's stretch your imagination. I didn't bother wasting the ink to print up, but you can just imagine I'm holding a big lump of coal. You all know what coal looks like, right? Which wavelength of the light spectrum is that material reflecting? Right. Coal has a specific molecular structure that allows no part of the color spectrum to be reflected. Rather, it totally absorbs the full color spectrum, and so you see black. In the Bible, in Lamentations 4.8, talking about the punishment of the sin of Sodom, calls it, their visage is blacker than coal. Well, what makes a black coal such a fitting symbol for sin? You know, when you stop and think of it, coal is actually a result of man's refusal to transmit 
or reflect God's light. The antediluvians chose to selfishly absorb, as does coal, rather than to selflessly reflect, as does a jewel, or transmit. Coal comes from, mainly from the buried remains of these antediluvians and their habitat, buried by the flood on account of their selfishness. Would you expect to find a chunk of coal in a crown of jewels? No. What is coal only fit for? Fit to be burned. Get the point? Let's look back at colors. That's better. Yes. Sin, we know, is combustible material. When you mix blue and yellow together, what color do you get? Green. How about yellow and red? Orange. What color do we get if you mix all seven colors? I'm going to call it seven yet. All seven colors of the spectrum. Right. The number seven symbols perfection. So if we mix all the seven colors together, we discover the color of perfection. Now, if we had a color wheel of spin, I got to get one of those, a color wheel up here, and you spin it, and you spin it rapidly, guess what you see? White. You stop it, you see the seven colors. When a material reflects the entire color spectrum and absorbs nothing, when all the glory of the light is being reflected, white is produced. Did you know white is, maintained, is, is mentioned in the Bible 66 times? Black, by the way, is mentioned only 18 times. White's first mentioned in Genesis 30. It's last mentioned in Revelation 20. And even in our opening song today is, comes from Isaiah 118. Spoke of the color white that though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Daniel 7.9 tells us the Father's garments are white as snow. Mark 9.3, speaking of the Son, says, And his raiment becoming shining, or became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as that no fuller on earth can whiten them. We also get to wear white, right? Revelation 3, 4, and 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Revelation 19, 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Revelation 2.17, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saying he which will receive it. Revelation 20.11, and I saw a great white throne. So friends, you get the picture. White symbolizes righteousness and perfection, right? Turn to 1 John 1.5, if you will. 1 John 1, 5. It says, God is what? Light. And in him is no darkness at all. God is light. Now, use your imagination again, and, and let's just say, and I'll never do this, but if we had a big, bright light, flashlight, a big light like a landing light on an airplane, and they shine it in your eyes, does it make you very happy? Hmm. Pretty hard to appreciate when you're blinded by the light. And we can understand more of the perfection and the glory of light much better by looking at the individual colors and parts that make up the light. Now we know there are millions of color variations. Like 
remember the, I don't know, the older days, I remember at least in, when you used to get a, a manual with your computer <laughs> when you bought it. I remember one, yeah, there were, there were 16 million color variations I could use for my fonts and whatever you wanted to do. Just, uh, boom, mind blowing. How many different color variations there are? Or if you catch a hummingbird in the right light and you see the iridescence gleaming off it and just, they're flying jewels. Gorgeous. But friends, out of all of that beauty, we find that only Jesus reflected the full spectrum of God's character. We are only capable of reflecting a small part of God's love and character through us individually. And yet, your character and personality will reflect a unique color of God's character that no one else has ever had or ever will again. That's how special you are. You can see why we're called God's jewels in Malachi 3. He wants all of his jewels. He wants them all gathered back to him. So the question I think that begs to be asked is, will it matter if anyone here this morning or anyone watching misses out on heaven? What about the person living next door to us? Will there be a loss if he or she is not there? You, along with your neighbor, are capable of revealing a part of the glory of God in a way that no other person can. If you're not in heaven, an aspect of God's character and his creative power, the only you are capable of revealing will be forever gone. Of those millions of colors, let's just say you reflect the turquoise spectrum of God's character. And remember that no other person can reflect the shade of the color as you do. And if you are not in heaven, no one will ever get to see and know that faucet of God's love. Sister White, Great Controversy, page 640, says, Only in eternity can we rightly estimate the loss of a single soul. Every person in this world, every person is a jewel capable of transmitting and reflecting the glory of God. John 1, 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man. That means every woman too. So why are not all people reflecting the aspects of God's glory? Well, even scripture tells us in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, starting in verse 19. John 3, starting in 19, where he says, And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. <laughs> Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they were wrought in God. Remember, friends, it is the light that gives beauty and value to the jewel. That person will be eternally saved to shine as a jewel to the glory of God if they will but stop hanging on to the darkness, resisting the light, and allow God's true character to start working within them and within us to shine through them so that God may be glorified. Amen. Let me get a little personal here. 
Have you ever been called an ignoramus? Okay, you don't have to answer that. Because that term would fit someone who would love darkness rather than light. And yet there are a lot of ignorant folk in this world who are doing just that. Hebrews 5.2 tells us to have compassion on the ignorant. If they only knew what they were doing, many would come to their senses and come to the Lord. We need to have compassion for those committing sins of ignorance. Not judgment, not harshness. Compassion. The rulers who crucified the Son of God, did they commit a sin of ignorance when they carried out their wicked plot? Go to the book of Acts, chapter 3. Acts, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 14, says, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Verse 17, and now, brethren, I want that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. What were the rulers ignorant of? Turn over to Romans. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Paul says that if they had not been ignorant, quote, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's 1 Corinthians 2.8. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. Forgive their sin of ignorance. God knows that they are but jewels in the dark. The potential is there if they would only come to the light. There is mercy for anyone who commits the sins of ignorance. One might say that sin, sins of ignorance can be defined as those sins committed by anyone who is ignorant of the power of the gospel. If God has delivered you from ignorance as he did Saul, who became Paul, and you now have the knowledge of the light of God, you will, as Matthew 5.16 says, let that light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. That's the light shining through you as a gem. So why do your good works? Why would they cause the Father to be glorified? What's the source of those good works? What's the source of the ruby's redness? It's not of yourselves, lest you would boast. It's of the light. Isaiah 60, starting in verse 1 through 3, says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. What a beautiful promise. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. 
in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his son that serves him. Malachi 3.17. He is coming soon to collect his jewels for his crown. Like the chorus of our closing hymn says, like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they all shall shine in their beauty. Bright gems for his crown. Amen. Talking about us. It is Jesus' stone collection. Beautiful stones. Polished. Scrubbed. Gotten rid of all the dirt. So that we can reflect his character through us and even in our personality, in our particular hue that God had created in us for his glory to shine through, to draw others to him and bring him glory. There on his crown will be a jewel of, say, magenta. And another crown of maybe, uh, another stone of, of maybe the ruby red we were talking about. And between those two stones are those jewels. There's a blank spot reserved for a jewel where Fuchsia, maybe, was to be. Fuchsia. What's fuchsia like? That just may be the specific aspect of God's character that you reflect most. And no one but God will ever know what fuchsia looks like if you're not there. And you can plug in every person you know, all those you don't know, you drive by, you shop with, you walk by, every human. Great Controversy 640, once again, only in eternity can we rightly estimate the loss of a single soul. Powerful, huh? God is amazing. Let's make sure that we are becoming polished, transparent gems that only transmit the glory and the love of God. I pray that you'll think of that as you go through your daily life. Because he is coming back soon, very soon, to make up his crown with his jewels. I pray we're all there. May he be glorified. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a beautiful picture of your love and how you think of us. Lord, we are gems made by God that he so desires to gather us back to him that Jesus would come and die for us so that we may be restored and brought back up to the level he had created us in to grow forever and to sing his praises and to show his love through us. Father, it's humbling. But we pray that you would deepen our awareness of the importance of each one of us, but Lord, also each and every person out there so, Lord, use us, shine through us, so that others may be drawn to you. And, Father, forgive us for our ignorance. Forgive us for the sin, the darkness that we may still be hanging on to. And, Lord, help us to get rid of that so that your glory would shine unimpeded. For all glory and all honor goes to the light everlasting. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your love. Amen. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.